high. Another change in 2.1 is that the admin slash your username and password, the generic admin user, uh, is used as now discouraged. Simply because everybody knows that it's an administrator account, everybody knows it's password, so it's not, not really secure. So in 2.1, you can change the password of the admin account in that client app screen that we saw in the last slide. So each installation can have its own password. Or you can, you can disable the account entirely, um, which, can be done, which can be done by a configuration file. And naturally, you need it to be, in, be enabled the first time you start the engine up, because otherwise you wouldn't be able to log in and add other users to, to the resource service. So it's enabled by default, but it can be disabled in the web XML of the engine. If you do choose to, to disable it, you better make sure that there's any services that are running aren't using that admin your username and password to log on to the engine. Because once you disable it, they won't be able to log on anymore. So all of the um, all of the services that run, sorry, that are distributed to 2.1 have had their user ID passwords changed to the new way so they can log on even if this admin account is disabled. So over time we discovered we sorry we we encourage people to disable that account once they've loaded the first time and added that some users. Um, with a little bit more security, and we don't pretend for one minute that this is terribly secure, and people can still get into it in other ways, but passwords are now hashed on the client side. In other words, they're, they're encrypted, and they're, those hashed passwords are all installed in the tables on the engine side. So if, you, if you're connecting through the, to the engine through the API, if you, if you send a plain uh, password, plain text to it, it will hash it for you before it sends it across to the engine. And it will just compare the hash password to the hash password that's stored in the engine. So no more plain uh, password storage on the engine side. As a byproduct of this, any service <coughs> replication that is registered with the engine is automatically accessible through the resource service as well. So any of those services can log on to the resource service through its APIs as well. So the resource service, to put that another way, accepts all of the registrations that are done in the engine for services and applications. External data gateway. Um, 2.1 implements the push to pull from environment. Um, data at the case and the task level. So whereas previously you always had to map from a net level to a task level variable and back again, now you can go directly to some of the data source that's external to the engine completely and map that to, to, to a case level variable or a task level variable and back out again. You can open the each, each data gateway is like a, 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 a plug-in, each data gateway is, is, is a class that will accept calls from the engine at runtime for those variables that are mapped to it, and it's up to that plug-in to then decide what data is going to be uh, supplied for that data. Because of that uh, um, structure, um, the plug-in can get the data from any, from any, from any source, so any database or text files, Excel spreadsheet, or whatever web service, whatever that is. And they can be mixed too, so you can map some variables in a task in the traditional way and others in the data gateway. There's a second tab on the um, update task per am uh, dialogue now, as well as being able to do the, tr the traditional X query method. You can also choose a data gateway. In this example, we've only got one data gateway. Of, uh, one data gateway available for that. As time goes on, and people add their own data gateways here, they'll show up on the list. They can choose which data gateway they want to use in this case to populate the student either student task group. And here we can see when we update the parameters for the enrolled task, we can see the subject code gets its mapping in the usual way from the net level variable of the same name. Whereas a student of a very variable gets its value from the external data gateway. 
That's how it's done for the task level. At the case level, you can choose for each specification where it gets its initial case variable going control if you want it to be external like AI. At runtime, for example, a resource service workers handler will look at this, and if there's something set there, it won't show a a tool to capture those initial case variables. Is it getting it from, from external? If it's not getting it from external, then the workers handler will show that initial data form to capture the initial case variables. Okay, question without notice. When should this net be considered complete? Note that there's an AND split here. So when A completes, it starts B and C, and there's an XOR join. As, as a sub question, it might be how many times should D fire in this net? Once or twice? Once for each of B and C, or only once? If you said only once in 2.0, you'd be correct. If you said twice in 2.0, you would also be correct. It's not desirable. There was a difference between the way root nets and subnets were handled in 2.0 and previous versions of your back to your version DOF. The subnet was con considered complete whenever a token reached the output condition, whereas a root net was considered complete only when all possible tokens reach the output condition. So in other words, in the subnet, you complete when one reached the output. A root net would only complete when both of those tokens from B and C reached the output. And of course, that wasn't desirable behaviour. The root net wasn't meeting the semantics of the uh, of standard workflow net. So in 2.1, all nets are considered complete as soon as a single token reaches the output. So that's consistent within the engine, and it's also cons consistent within the definition of work failures. Two point one also includes a new service called the monitor service, which displays a hierarchical information of all active cases that are currently running in the engine. We can look at um, for each case, each case's work items and then drill down from a work item to look at its variables. As well as the variables, you can see their mapping data, uh, their current val values, their original values, who it's assigned to, that sort of thing, also information from the process log data. And the one of the service is very much a working process. It's just a basic service at the moment, which shows that hierarchical set of data. Um, the data is not persistent, so if you restart the engine, we're going to pick up new cases that have been started since the engineering starts. Um, but it does provide a platform to be expanded in the future and it will be extended in future versions. And we'll, look, we'll just look at a brief example of that in a moment. Um, in the original slide, when we saw the architecture, we saw the interface O, which allows you to plug data sources or organisational models, data sources into the resource service. The default um, data model that's embedded in the resource service and uh, uses, that, in, uses that, in, that, that, in, that interface. In 2.1, an, L, an LDAP source has also been added that also uses that interface. Now, the interface is designed so that you can bring in all data from any data source, so as well as, as uh, database files through Hibernate, which is the default way. You can use JWC to get to database files. You can, you can uh, plug in spreadsheets or text files or whatever you like. 2.1 would provide an LDAP server as another, both as, both as a service to those environments that have LDAP or data, and also as a further example of how Interface O can be used to capture organisational data from any data source. Um, it's configurable through a properties file so that you can configure it for your own Installation gives a different flavours of LDAP, and each LDAP server has its own way of storing information. But basically, through this interface, it takes the data from the data source and maps it to the objects that the resource service understands. Um, it can be used in conjunction with your internal or data table. So, for example, if you only want to use the LDAP server to capture 
participants and roles. Um, and that's the only, only two ob sets of objects that you capture from this LDAP server. Then things like capabilities, position numbers, and all groups can be built within the default tables and site rules as well. So you can have a hybrid sort of system. So whatever you're going to bring in from the external, you can use your internal tables to make up the difference. And those tables will always be associated with that data source. So also, also new in 2.1, you can uh, delegate the authentication of user ID and password information to the data source. So in 2.0, you have to load every, all participants' user IDs and passwords into the resource service and it would handle authentication. Now you can configure data sources to send the user ID to the data source and it sends back a message to say whether the password you sent is the right one. So delegated authentication. Also new in 2.1 are timer status predicates. So any task that you create a design time that you add a timer to automatically gets generated an implicit status variable within the whole net that you can use uh, as a predicate in flow conditions. So for example, if I've got a task in this net called my task and we create a, a uh, timer for it, then we can add these sorts of predicates to the flow conditions coming out of any task within the net. And we can say if, if my task has not expired yet, then go on this branch, otherwise the other branch, or if it's dormant. Um, each status is either dormant, active, closed, or expired. Dormant means the timer has not yet started. Active means it's, it's started, that it's currently running, it has not yet expired. Closed means the task completed before the timer reaches its expiry time. Expired means it's expired before the task completed. So that makes think life a little bit easier at runtime by testing flow conditions based on time and stage rather than having to add uh, vari vari variables at, at design time, true or false values depending on whether or not times have actually run out or not. And again, any task within the net is, av is available throughout the net for those sorts of predicates. Okay, 2.1 also supports the Worklist Visualizer, Visualizer tool, which was developed by uh, Massimilia Di Leone and others in, uh, from the University of Rome. So, University of Rome, isn't it? That's up there, isn't it? Yes, yeah. yeah. um, Support for process configuration, we've already seen Marshall um, demonstrate that. The location, the location of the default Worklist is now configurable. So, rather than having the resource service, um, added as a service, as it had to be in 2.0 and 2.1, it's configurable through uh, web XML. So you can easily unplug resource service and plug in another work based handler into place through configuration file. As it enhances to the org data management form, which we'll look at in a moment, the new check for uninitialized data variables when you load a specification. Um, many people have run into the difficulty where they're running a specification and because you map from a net to a task a variable value that has not yet been, been initialized, the, uh, the specification fails. So that checks for this when you load the specification. We'll look at an example of that in a moment. There's all sorts of improvements, enhancements, things to under the surface. Uh, form flow faster, for example. Much, much more. <clears throat> okay.